Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third uh, webinar in our series. Uh, it's really been exciting uh, having this journey uh, and talking to so many different folks in the Muslim community about uh, public health uh, in terms of access to care. Um, today in our third series, we're so uh, excited to be joined by Dr. Abdul Al Sayyid. Uh, uh, no relation, he's an Al Sayyid, I'm just a Sayyid. Uh, but we're also obviously brothers in Islam and we're uh, glad that he can join us today. Um, just so you all know, this is being sponsored today by Ummah Community Clinic. Uh, you all have been supporters and um, have helped us transform the trajectory of people's lives um, uh, on a daily basis. And during this month of Ramadan, uh, as we round out these last 10 nights uh, and these very special nights of Ramadan, uh, we, you know, we have an appeal to you to also consider Ummah as part of your larger giving uh, to, to the community so we can continue to uplift and the mandate that you all have given us in the community to carry on our work. So we're really excited uh, to be able to, to do that. I pray that Ramadan has been going well for all of you. Uh, so we'll definitely jump in uh, to the conversation today. So I wanted to just quickly introduce uh, Dr. Abdul Al Sayyid. Um, you may know him from you know, television, his books. Uh, he made history actually by becoming the youngest public health official in a major American city in Detroit. Um, he was called one of the brightest young stars in the future of the progressive movement by Senator Bernie Sanders. Uh, he hosts a popular podcast called America Dissected. Uh, it's a leading, he's also a leading epidemiologist and author of Healing Politics, and we'll be touching upon um, some of what he wrote in his book, and I truly uh, recommend everyone to pick up that book. I think it, become, it builds such a larger narrative of not only public health from a perspective of a practitioner, uh, but also someone who's uh, American and Muslim and the multiple identities that Dr. Abdul Sayyid has in his, his, his life course in terms of doing the work he's doing today. Um, he's currently also a CNN contributor and advocate for infusing public health and education with social justice um, across parties and conversations that is happening across the United States. Um, and we're really happy to have him on board. So welcome, Jazakallah uh, Khair, Dr. Abdul Sayyid for joining us today. Adil, thank you so much uh, for having me. I'm just a huge fan of Umma Clinic. You guys are, um, you know, you, you sort of set the standard of how we think about uh, the ways that our community invests in uh, primary care and invests in the broader uh, community beyond uh, our, our Muslim community space. And so, um, you know, that, that kind of leadership infusing uh, our ideals about justice and about investment in the people around us about our care for our neighbor uh, into communities. Uh, that, that starts with uh, organizations like yours. So I, I'm just really honored to be here with you. Um, Jazakumullah khair for your work and uh, Ramadan Kareem to everybody out there. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, accept what has been a, um, uh, we'll just say an uncommon uh, Ramadan and hopefully one that we never have to repeat again. Inshallah, Jazakumullah khair. So, you know, I wanted to maybe use um, part of the conversation to talk about your book because I think you touch upon so many different uh, interesting points and perspectives. and. You know, just, you know, for folks that don't know you and, you know, have maybe just looking at your bio or just heard what I just said, you know, what ignited your passion in public health, right? I know in, in healing politics, you talk about uh, your own story of growing up and, uh, and, and, you know, mixed families and having different identities and as you traverse yourself through both uh, professional school and going abroad as well. But really, what ignited your passion around public health and why do you feel like the intersection of public health and social justice is so intricately tied together? So uh, for me, I, I grew up um, in Metro Detroit, and I'd spent a lot of my summers, like uh, a lot of second generation kids, um, going back to the uh, quote unquote motherland. And for me, that was Egypt. Um, and so when I was there, I get to hang out with the wisest, most intelligent human being I've ever met. And that was my grandmother, Saad, um, but she never got to go to school. And she lost two of the infants that she gave birth to of eight total. Um, and so in my, in my family alone, uh, in my father's generation, the infant mortality rate was 25%. Um, and I used to sit with her and she'd constantly remind me, there's nothing special about you. What's special is the opportunity you've had. She'd point to one of my cousins and that one's you know, smarter than you and that one's uh, better looking than you and that one's taller than you. Um, but you have an opportunity. And um, the crazy thing is that, you know, I would appreciate what that opportunity meant across 15 hours when I'd go uh, from my suburban home to Egypt. But then I could also travel about 25 minutes south and travel the same distance in life expectancy, 10 years in a gap, if I were to go south anywhere into uh, Detroit city limits. And so that for me really crystallized um, the ways that all of uh, the, the features of our lives and the inequities in those features, whether it's access to a good job, 
for clean air and water, for uh, 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 the ability to make sure that you know you have a roof over yours and your kids' uh, heads, uh, or healthy food. Like the ways those things get under the skin, um, public health allows you a way to quantify that. And, um, and so for me, I thought I wanted to be a doctor to, to do something about this. But as I started to appreciate the brokenness of our healthcare system, the healthcare system that you all uh, are, are on the front lines of helping to fix and, and helping to supplement, um, I, I realized that there was something a lot bigger um, and it was those features uh, of life that, that really dictated uh, the, the, the difference in, in who got to live a long, healthy life and who didn't. Um, and it was exactly those opportunities my grandmother was telling me about all along. Uh, and so embracing public health to me was about embracing all of the things that shape who gets to live a long, healthy life and who doesn't, um, and what it means for us to lead uh, to fix them. And you know, public health is that place where science meets politics. And even you know, in college, before I had crystallized what I wanted to do, I studied biology and politics. And you know, folks would, would tease me, they'd say, how are, you, how are you gonna put those things together? And at that point, I had no clue. Uh, but it turned out that my answer really was public health, that place where um, we need to, to, to make our politics work um, to advance what the science tells us we need to do uh, to empower people to live their longest, healthiest life. Yeah, and I think, you know, given the current context, when, and I'm sure you've been commenting on, you know, even our COVID-19 response as a community, you know, I think you've, you've underscored and we are underscoring and folks that have worked on the ground in underserved communities that, you know, the, the, the COVID-19 situation didn't further create inequities. It actually just highlighted the current existing inequities. Uh, so when you look at access to testing, when you look at access to just general over, over, you know, care in our communities, how have you seen the impact on black and brown communities, even, you know, local to you in Detroit, in terms of our response to COVID-19, right? When you have the entire New Jersey Nets basketball team and Denver Nuggets basketball team getting tested, therefore public testing is even talked about, um, what does it say to the stat status of health healthcare access inequities that have already been exacerbated with this situation? What, what have you seen on the ground? And as an epidemiologist, what things are now coming to the forefront that people should be paying attention to? Yeah, that's a really, really important question. I just want to give you the numbers in Michigan where I, I live. 14% uh, of Michigan are black Michiganders. 40% of COVID-19 deaths are to black Michiganders. And it's getting worse, not better. And that fact is about not the way that a virus discriminates, because we know viruses don't see differences. It's the way that people discriminate. And this social physics that uh, we've created in our society, where we've patterned access to a very basic set of resources uh, based on race and, and based on socioeconomic position. So black and brown communities have been hit the hardest. Now, um, a lot of folks say, well, you know, this, this, this pandemic has uncovered so many things. And it hasn't really uncovered it unless you haven't been looking. Um, and for folks who've been suffering those disparities, uh, they've known a lot of these things all along. That social physics is uh, a reality because, of course, it leaves uh, all of the worst things falling uh, on top of them. And, you know, when, when, when you look at that, um, you think about COVID-19 and then think about infant mortality. Those are two very different physiological outcomes. But the disparity in deaths to COVID-19 or deaths to babies at baseline is almost exactly the same. And so you have to ask a question, well, how did that happen? It points to all of the social causes and the social determinants uh, that we call them in public health that shape access to health and disease in the long term. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is, you know, for a lot of us of privilege, people, um, you know, who get to quote unquote socially distance because uh, we don't have to choose between saving uh, our lives or the lives of our loved ones uh, and staying home or going out to save our livelihoods. Um, for those of us with privilege, when we talk about where we want to go from here, let's make sure that we don't talk about going back to quote unquote normal. Because even before COVID-19, that was a normal where black and brown people suffered disproportionately uh, diseases that are preventable. It was a normal where 10% uh, of people were locked out of the healthcare system. Another 50% had a deductible so high that their healthcare was in effect behind a paywall. Uh, it was a normal where people watched as their jobs got chipped away into gigs that didn't come with basic benefits. It was a normal uh, where the, 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 the living wage um, that everybody should be able to expect in the richest, most powerful country in the world uh, was something that was bargained away. And the funny thing about it is that when COVID-19 hit, those people who we kept telling we, we, we couldn't afford to pay uh, a, a basic livable minimum wage, all of a sudden we deemed them essential, right? Uh, and so, you know, we, we deem their, uh, their label, labor essential when we need it most, um, but we deem them expendable. And it tells us a lot about the kind of attitudes that created 
uh, the rifts that we see when COVID-19 came in. And so, you know, in some respects, you, uh, you think about the wind blowing on a house of bricks versus a house of cards. Um, and it's the same wind, but, uh, but it affects uh, different houses differently. And unfortunately, our society for too many people is a house of cards uh, because of the fundamental vulnerabilities of American life right now. It's, it's something I talk a lot about in, uh, in the book. And I think this concept that you talk about in the book that uh, kind of the refrain throughout is just the insecurity syndrome, right? And in chapter 10 in particular, right, you talk about uh, school-based um, access to health and you talk about a few examples in, in Detroit. And as OMA Clinic, we have a school-based health center on the campus of John C. Fremont High School, uh, where not only the 2,800 uh, students on campus have access to primary care and behavioral health services, uh, but the surrounding community as well. And, you know, when you look at, you know, what happened in Flint, right, in your backyard, as well as uh, the continued inequities, how have you seen the issue of um, uh, campus is so important, right? And when we talk about, right, how do we, how do we get to this point? Because oftentimes, uh, you know, people with privilege or perceived privilege, right, there's this notion of, uh, why can't people just pull up their cells by their own bootstraps, right? You've been working in underserved communities for how many years now, and you still haven't been able to come up with these outcomes. Um, you know, they just need to work harder. They need to try harder. And I think even in uh, American Muslim communities, oftentimes we hear this uh, kind of repeated. Uh, and sometimes I think um, just because they don't know better and sometimes even more maliciously. So, I mean, that pipeline starts a lot earlier, right? So as an epidemiologist, as someone who's been on the front lines, can you, can you kind of set the table of what this uh, kind of pandemic of insecurity syndrome looks like for the community that, you know, that we serve? That's right. Adel. Um, so I talk about this idea, right, that, that um, if you look at where we are in our politics, it's driven by the fact that the basic systems that people have relied upon in their lives, whether it's an educational system or a food system or a healthcare system or a political system or an economic system, that those systems are, are being degraded. And that's left us fundamentally insecure. And um, I, I think it's critical for us to appreciate the way that this insecurity uh, plays out and the ways that for, for, for those of us who uh, aren't affected as, as deeply by material insecurity, um, it tricks us into thinking uh, that there is agency where there's not. And let me just explain what I mean by that. Um, you know, I hear often from, uh, you know, immigrants or children of immigrants, well, you know, I came here or my dad came here with $5 in their pocket. And the point that I always make is like, yeah, but they came with an MD in their brain or, you know, a PhD uh, uh, ready to go for them. Um, and that human capital difference is, is gigantic. Um, you know, I always tell folks, look, if you were to take everything I, I had, everything, you know, take, take, take all, all of my money, all of my resources, uh, and you put me on the street, I bet I could get them back pretty fast. And the reason why is because most of the capital that I have um, is inside of me. Right? It's an education that I got to have. It's a way uh, of being able to leverage relationships that I can go to. Um, and we can't take those things for granted because uh, not all of our wealth is just basic money. Um, it comes in human capital form as well. And so investing in building that human capital is really critical. And that happens mostly uh, in schools. And you know, one of the biggest, um, I, I think, indictments on American society right now is the fact that we've allowed access to education, uh, the ability to invest in the next generation, uh, to be patterned by what the generation before them had. And so all we're doing is deepening the uh, social barriers and uh, the social obstacles that too many people face to having uh, the kind of life that, that, that everyone and anyone in the richest, most powerful country in the world deserves. And so um, starting in schools like you all are doing, I think is absolutely critical. And let's be clear, a school is more than just a place where somebody gets an education. Because if you're a kid who has to worry about where their next meal is coming from, about whether or not you're going to get health care if you get sick, about whether or not your parents may lose a job, about whether or not your dad's in the house because uh, of our over-eager criminal legal system uh, that, that, that is basically criminalized black and brown people. Um, if you're somebody like that, right, your ability to just sit in an overclouded classroom and learn what's on the board uh, is deeply limited. And one of the things that we did at the health department, for example, uh, was make sure kids just had a pair of glasses because if you can't see what's on the blackboard, it does not matter what's happening on the blackboard. And so your situation in the high schools to make sure uh, that for kids for whom healthcare may be an obstacle, <clears throat> that uh, because of Oma Clinic's work, you're supporting that. Um, people don't appreciate just how far that goes as a, as a ripple um, in uh, the, the social fabric of American life. Uh, to taking on some of the insecurity and the inequities uh, that, that hurt so many kids. And so I really appreciate that work. And I'm really grateful that you were thinking 
strategically about how uh, to invest in taking on uh, interge interge intergenerational poverty by uh, leveraging the school as not just an educational unit, but also uh, a space to be able to empower a young person as they move on in their lives. Yeah, and I think, you know, Alhamdulillah, that, that campus now is, is even growing even more, right? We have our primary care clinic that's there. Uh, we're going to be adding a dental facility in the next few months uh, that will be uh, on that campus. And then we have a one acre community garden that's there. So there's open space, right? And you, you touched on it a little bit in terms of the social determinants and uh, a, a term that everyone's using these days um, in terms of food insecurity, right? So we being on the ground, we heard from our patients, well, you keep telling us to lead healthy lives and change our behaviors and eat better, but we're in a food desert. Where, where's the access to healthy food, right? And so we said, okay, let's partner up. So alhamdulillah, now we've been giving out over 30,000 pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables through a free farmer's market. Can you talk about a little bit of the effects of food and food insecurity from your vantage point? I know you touch upon it in the book as well, uh, but primary examples of why you know, health is not just confined to the four corners of, a, of an exam room or what happens between a provider and a patient and why it's so important, even as Muslim communities, right? And alhamdulillah, we have so many organizations and charities trying to tackle different pieces of this. But I, I would argue, and not just because I'm sitting here in, in terms of uh, on, on the healthcare side, but it all tell, it comes under the umbrella of health and wellness, right? You can't have a healthy mind and body and soul without access to food and without access to behavioral health, without access to, to housing, right, without access to a job and, and a stable job, without access, you know, a fear of not having the police, you know, uh, overly police a community. So can you talk about in the context of that food and food inequities and, and what you've seen on the ground? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, like uh, LA where you work, um, I was the commissioner of health in Detroit and uh, Detroit uh, is also a food desert. I actually prefer the term food swamp, um, meaning that there is food. It's just not the kind of food that you want. And uh, you know, most of where people pick up their daily provisions are liquor stores uh, or gas stations. And the food that's available there is uh, mass manufactured for, uh, for taste and caloric density. And that's exactly the kind of food um, that you don't want people to be limited to if you're trying to take on obesity or hypertension or hypercholesterolemia uh, or diabetes. And so um, this leaves people in dire circumstances around uh, their ability to actually live a healthy life because they just don't have the means of doing it. Um, and that is a function of uh, a fundamental economics. And, um, and so being able to build a community garden, a community resource where people are invested uh, in um, creating the food that they're going to eat and then have access to it, um, I think is just, is just fundamental to being able to take on uh, what have become the most dominant killers in American society, particularly uh, in, um, in low income communities and particularly in black and brown communities. Um, and then the, the, the last point I'll just make here is that <clears throat> a, a lot of folks don't appreciate why food insecurity, which is ostensibly the lack of access to food, would cause obesity, which is uh, something that we know affects lower income communities more. Because the conventional logic would be, well, uh, you know, if, if, if folks are, uh, are, 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 um, don't have resources, they just shouldn't eat as much and, and therefore they shouldn't be obese. Well, here's the thing. If you don't know where your next meal is coming from, and I give you a meal right now, what do you do to the meal you're, you, you have in front of you? You're gonna eat the whole thing. And then you get another meal. What do you do? You eat the whole thing. Particularly if that meal is, uh, is super high in fat and super high in carbs because that's the only food that you have uh, available in your community. So you can see how that adds up to creating an obesity epidemic pretty quickly despite the fact that the fundamental problem here is actually the absence of food, uh, but food on demand when you need it uh, to be able to set your appetite. And so um, food insecurity is a principal cause of um, of, of, of obesity and diabetes, and um, it is wholly preventable, and it's preventable by providing people access to a consistent food uh, resource when they need it uh, and where they need it. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think it, it, it factors into uh, consideration. Right? People with limited budgets have to make determinations of, are they going to go get health care? Are they going to go get food? Are they going to take care of some other needs? You know, what percentage is going to rent? What other necessities? And I think this is what you kind of go into chapter 13 when you're talking about the inequ uh, inequities in healthcare access, right? You talk about this idea uh, in quoting research around this eight different Americas that's out there, right? The, the 21 years lifespan, even within a short driving distance, right? And I think it's also this misnomer that folks have oftentimes of being uninsured and underinsured, right? Sometimes being underinsured is more costly than even being uninsured. Uh, because of what happens if you were to seek care and that care is not provided for. And I think at Oma Clinic, right, um, we're one of those clinics where folks can continuously go to the ER. We actually have referral coordinators who are 
uh, working with patients even before they're discharged to be like, here's your next appointment. It's going to be at the community clinic. Here's someone who can, you know, help you manage your, 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 your chronic condition, get the medications you need through our uh, prescription 340B program, which gives folks, you know, uh, low cost medication and we'll be able to subsidize that uh, funding for them. So when you talk about these inequities that, that, are, that are robust and you talk about the for-profit model of healthcare, what have you seen where safety net clinics like UMA, right? What gap are they closing in the larger grand scheme of things if we talk about American, American healthcare? Yeah, so the, the point you hit on, I think is, is, is exactly right, right? Just like food insecurity, <clears throat> it's not just about if you have a thing, it's about when you have it and consistent access to that thing um, and where in the, in the, in the cycle uh, you get that thing. And UMA clinic, I think, um, fills two holes in particular. Number one, for 10% of people who just don't have access to healthcare, it is their primary care resource. And that's just, uh, you, you can't uh, undersell the fact that in, in, in the richest, most powerful country in the world, 27 million people don't have access to healthcare. And, and that's just, that is absurd. Um, but that's where an organization like OMS is so critical. But the second piece is this. For a lot of people, as you mentioned, they may have some kind of insurance. The problem is, is that they, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have health access. Why? Because it could be that their deductible or their copay is so expensive that they can't actually pay to get access to the insurance that they have, right? They're charged at the point of care and so that they just don't seek care. And OMA Clinic is critical for them. But the other part of it is also that, um, that there's a lot of communities that are just uh, medical deserts, right? There, there aren't doctor's offices that will take uh, patients with certain kinds of uh, insurance. And so you may be insured, but if there's no doctor who takes your insurance, well, then you're uh, functionally without healthcare even still. Um, and so having an organization like UMMA that doesn't discriminate based on insurance status uh, provides fundamental health care for those folks who don't have it and then provides access to health care for folks who may have health insurance but don't have a, a, a position close to them uh, or for folks for whom uh, the, the, the paywall to get to their insurance is so high uh, that they need a, another service. And so having that resource in a community uh, like uh, the LA community that you serve um, is, is a fundamental uh, uh, access for folks um, to get the, the care they need when they get sick. Um, and it's, it's just super critical uh, that we as a community, as a Muslim community, are invested in the well-being of uh, folks who may not have the same resources that we have and invested in our own neighborhood. And I think one of the other important points you mentioned, and I think oftentimes gets um, uh, either, either is glossed upon, you know, glossed over, but you know, we live in a society where healthcare is a for-profit model, right? By and large, Right. When you walk into a hospital, when you walk into any any point of care, if you're going to any for profit healthcare institution, their end goal is to maximize profit. Right. There's no doubt about that. I think you talk about even as a as, as a doctor, as you're getting trained, right? You have you have these courses on how to maximize revenue and how to make sure you're billing at your highest level. And you know, care goes outside the door, right? So I think you know, you, you, once you're operating in something like that, right, you have then what do you do when prescription drugs are being, you know, what, what is, how does a patient go fill a prescription? How do they make sure they can go to the pharmacy and not uh, get price gouged across the board, right? So community clinics are so vital at that intersection, uh, as you said, to be able to provide those services. And I think another area, and perhaps you can speak to a little bit about this, is behavioral health services. So alhamdulillah, Umma, uh, you know, three years ago, we started integrating behavioral health because we know that a treatment plan for a patient can't just be a primary care uh, treatment and or a behavioral health. It has to be a both. And so we understand that physical and mental health go hand in hand. And so our treatment plans for our patients take into account both the primary care visit, the behavioral health visit, the case manager who helps them navigate the system. I think a lot of uh, folks think, well, you know, they have Medi-Cal or, you know, for California, they have Medi-Cal, they can just navigate it. I think even folks with degrees and, you know, college educations, I don't know if everyone's ever, anyone been to a Medi-Cal site to enroll. We have covered California as our state exchange. That's hard enough to navigate. Add on layers of not having, having a language barrier, right? You talk about this double jeopardy type situations for access. So can you talk about access in the context of, okay, now, even if they do have access, walk us through from your vantage point of what you've seen at the, at the Department of Public Health when you were there in the city of Detroit. What does access mean to communities on the ground? Like, like what is a daily... What, what does it mean to actually just get access? And some people say, hey, they have access. They can just go to a clinic down the street that's located next to their yeah. home. So to, to have healthcare access, you need to be able to pay for it. You need to be able to go to it. You need to be able to interact with it, meaning that there's no language barrier or there's no disability barrier. 
You need to know that it's going to be there for you in, in all of the circumstances of your, your life. And then you need to know that it's going to need to know that it's going to be adequate. So that's a pretty big lift, especially in lower income communities. And, you know, we talked a little bit about um, sometimes why it's hard for folks with means to appreciate uh, what circumstances other people live in. But for people who don't have means, for poor folks across our country, you're arbitrating between needs, right? So it's either do you pay your rent or do you pay for your car note? Do you pay for uh, your groceries or do you pay for your water? Um, and healthcare tends to be one of those things that you push behind because, well, you may not need it right now, but you need to know that it's there for you. So having a community resource like Ummah is really important because for a lot of folks who uh, are making these really, really dire decisions, it's solving for all five of those uh, obstacles. And, um, and it's doing it in a way that is dignifying of the people that it serves uh, and empathic to their needs. And so, you know, if, if we're serious in our society about uh, not just uh, pretending like we've solved the problem, uh, of actually putting ourselves in other people's shoes and asking, what would it be like to have to toggle between needs? What would it be like to constantly live with the insecurity of knowing that it could all fall apart? That if my kid got sick or I got sick, I wouldn't know what to do. Um, a, an organization like Ummah exists so that, uh, that that's one less thing that you have to worry about and one more resource that is there for you if and when you need it. Absolutely. And I do think, you know, as you kind of moved on in your, in your book, you kind of give some solutions to that, right? And I'd love to kind of transition this conversation and talk about uh, that intersection you talked about, you know, merging public health and politics and, 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 and biology and, you know, going, going into public health and what you learned, right, as, as you know, one of the few American Muslims um, running a, a, a gubernatorial race, right, at that level and, and the only one being in that national spotlight, right? What, what are the some of the lessons learned, right? And talk, I think you talked about a little bit of this in chapter 20, right, towards the politics of empathy. And we're on this um, unique situation, right? You know, this post-COVID-19 reality as we enter an election year, as we go into, uh, you know, a time where, where majority of America is hurting, right? How do we, what, what's the empathy? What does empathy look like? How do we reach across? What's our mandate in your vantage point as American Muslims, um, who perhaps are, you know, for, this, for at least the Indo-Pakistani and immigrant background, American Muslims, maybe uh, not feeling the pinch as much or can have that luxury to self-isolate. Alhamdulillah, you know, the other great thing about Ummah is we're located uh, in a very predominantly African-American Muslim community in uh, Isla LA, Imam Jihad Safir. Uh, we've had um, multiple events. We, we cross-collaborate. There's a, some of the members of the community are on our board of directors. And this, so there's there's no this dichotomy of, oh, there's an immigrant-run organization like Umba Clinic, for example, uh, and then we have other folks. No, actually, many of the members of the African-American Muslim community are on our board of directors, and the majority of our board of directors are actually African-American, right, and, and Muslim as well. And so what is the mandate for American Muslims when we look at how do we share, show empathy, how do we share empathy at a time where, you know, the divisiveness of what we're seeing in our politics, and as we go into an election year when there's decisions to be made, uh, not only nationally, but locally, about the, the communities and the, the types of localities and schools and school boards and even local races that, you know, we have an impact on. What does that look like to you and what's your experience been? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's beautiful that we're reflecting on this in the month of Ramadan uh, when uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to, um, to fast. And the reason why he says, so that you can may, may attain consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you think about that, right, the, 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 the idea of fasting is about appreciating that those things can be taken away from you, right? And why could they be taken away from you? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives and the one who takes. And what that forces you to realize is that you and your sister or brother in humanity who may not have the same means that you do, you're actually all in the same boat. And it's of your humanity and of your commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the other part of this, this, this month is that we give. And the reason we give is out of appreciation for the fact that we have and for appreciation of the fact that we could have been people who didn't have. Um, and I think in, in that respect, I, I hope that for uh, you know, the, the, our community, we um, continue to invest in organizations like yours because even outside of Ramadan, it reminds us that we have a broader responsibility uh, beyond you know, our lives and our families and the things that keep us occupied from day to day, that we have a broader responsibility to be investing in our neighbor and uh, in humanity itself. Um, the other thing I'll say is that 
uh, as a Muslim community, sometimes we get really insular. And the reason we get li really insular, and I'll say it's just frankly, because there's a certain level of um, self-hate and self-fear about what people are going to say about us or think about us. And we're constantly working uh, in this you know, profound double consciousness, as W.E.B. Du Bois puts it, where we're asking not just what do I want to make in the world, but also what is the world going to make of what I'm making? Um, and uh, and I, I think there's a, there's a moment where we just step out of that and, and actually just lead with our um, humanity and lead with our vision for what we want for people. And if we get out of our own way, you'll find that a lot of people stop asking, you know, uh, how you pray. They're a lot more interested in what you pray for and what you're willing to do beyond, behind that prayer. Um, to, to make good on those things in the world. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is that, you know, even for folks who, um, who can say or do some really hateful things in the world, there's usually a pain that drives them. And I think sometimes if we're willing to step out of the pain they're causing and ask what's the pain that's driving them to do what they do, that we could, we could do such a, such a more profound job of lifting up solutions to that pain even despite what people are doing out of that pain. And um, I think we've got a real opportunity as a community. We've got a real, beyond an opportunity, a responsibility as a community. Um, remember the Prophet's message wasn't about uh, just um, empowering the, the, the Muslim community. It was about uplifting humanity. And it wasn't just about us as an identity group. It was about uh, us as a force for good in the world. Uh, and so I hope that this Ramadan, as we think about how we make good on that message about how we make good on uh, an appreciation for the fact that we have um, that empowering and uplifting and uh, working shoulder in shoulder with organizations like Ummah uh, all over the country uh, to be able to uh, drive um, the work of sustenance and security. Uh, I hope that's part of it. And you know, one thing, uh, a question that we've asked all of our speakers is, you know, um, what advice do you have just in conclusion for young people, right? You know, they're going to, they're, really, they're living new realities, right? If you're someone even in high, middle, I mean, I'll start even elementary, middle school, high school, um, you know, you might have, you might have had this, uh, you know, here's my path to success. Here's what I want to do, or here, I wanted to go in healthcare. Here's the steps I was going to take. And now not only modalities of education are changing, access to higher education. I mean, it was already rife with, you know, issues of access, even there, we talk about healthcare access, I think education access is a, is a topic is on its own and uh, education inequities. But what, would, what advice would you give to a high school person, an undergraduate person, you know, who was, who was bent on getting to medical school or um, trying to just figure out where they fit in uh, and want to make a difference and impact, right? And what are the conversations or some of the, the, the takeaways that you had on your own journey to establishing your identity uh, and trying to, to be able to, 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 to you know, not only look at doing good in the community, like you talked about, what, what are people going to say? And I think that what are people going to say always lingers, but given this new reality of where we are, and if I'm someone who's coming out of an MSA or wants to do good in the world and to start a family, you know, how did you traverse that to ensure that your faith is kept in alignment with the service and the work you're doing on the ground? And what advice would you have to give to that, to that population? Yeah. Um, I just, I, I'll say a couple of things. First, uh, learn to love yourself because Allah loves you and we love you. And um, we need you. And, uh, and I, I think it's hard. And when I say that, I don't, I don't say don't hold yourself accountable. I think there's a, when we talk about like self-love, there's this fake self-love, which is the self-love of just doing what you feel like doing whenever you feel like doing it. That's not real self-love. Real self-love um, is uplifting your, uh, your essence by being able to have that um, space where you both hold yourself uh, to a high standard and also empathize with yourself uh, and recognize that you know, there is no such thing called perfection in this world, um, but that, uh, but that you know, the imperfection is what makes humanity beautiful. Um, so learn to love yourself because we love you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. Uh, the second thing I'll say is that we focus a lot on a what. Like, what am I going to do? What position am I going to occupy? What job am I going to have? I just don't think the what's as important as the why. And I, I would really say, take some time to ask yourself your why. You know, and, 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 and the beauty of faith is that it centers why around something that's bigger than you. Um, it centers why around uh, a creator and the, the, what that creator commands of us, which is a righteous set of commandments about how we uh, owe the world around us and what it means to be able to empower that. Um, and so really focus on the why. Uh, and once you find the why, the what 
you know, may change and it may evolve. You know, my career has gone from medicine to, to, to science, to uh, government service, to politics, to activism. Um, and, uh, and I hope that, you know, it has always been um, as honest as I can be about trying to is isolate a why uh, and to chase that why wherever uh, it takes me and whatever it takes me. Um, and then the third thing I'll say is that, um, you know, change is in Instagram. Uh, it doesn't happen, you know, just because you, you know, you, you click something and now it's up and now you're getting likes. Like, that's not how it works. Change implies a lot of failure and a lot of pain. Um, and I think there is a tolerance to pain that as we think about growing, that we learn to, to take on. Um, a resilience to pain because uh, real change happens because you're willing to do the work. You're willing to fail. Um, but that why is big enough for you uh, that it drives you. Uh, to try and to fail and to try and to fail and to try and to succeed um, and then to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the success. And, um, and so I hope that, you know, those three things, learn to love yourself, uh, the, the, the real kind of love, the, the disciplined, honest kind of love, uh, that you find your why instead of your what, um, and then you, uh, you realize that the change is in, in, in the time and it's in the effort uh, and it's in the failure. No, that's, that's really appreciated. And I think, you know, just to round out the conversation, I uh, wanted to get your thoughts on what, what public health looks like going forward, right? Not only in a post COVID-19 era uh, where I think we'll have to just change our modalities of care and providing wellness, but right. Um, you know, the, the start and stop of Medicare for all in the campaign. And you've, you've spoken about that and, and, and been a, a strong proponent of in the, in the past and continue to be right. What, what does healthcare look like? And what do you feel like American Muslims have to offer, right? Given that, you know, you can't go to a hospital in the United States of America without a Muhammad, a Asma, or some type of Muslim individual on staff, either in primary care or specialty care. I mean, you will not go to a hospital in the United States without a Muslim on staff. And yet until this day, right, we don't have a Muslim hospital, right? You don't go into an atheist hospital. You go into a faith-based hospital at all times. And our mandate is such that even looking at, you know, how hospitals came about, if you're looking at the history of Ibn Sina, that the concept of a hospital originated from the Muslim tradition. This from the Islamic tradition. So what does, what does public health look like to you, right? So help us vision out a little bit. What does a, a just uh, public health system look like in the United States and where do Muslims fit into enabling that and helping to, to bring that about? Yeah, well, um, I will say, uh, you know, six months ago, nobody knew what an epidemiologist was. Now everybody's <laughs> like an epidemiologist on Twitter. Um, uh, so I, I think this moment has reminded us just how, uh, fickle healthcare and public health have been in this country uh, and how much work we have to take to investing it. And I will say that um, I think the dream of, of building a Muslim hospital is an extremely righteous dream. And I hope that it's uh, part of a broader network of investing in people in the places where they live, they learn, they work, they pray, they play, um, rather than just being the be all and end all of their care. And so I hope what we learn from this is that uh, it's a lot better to prevent something than it is to have to treat it that the consequences of failing to prevent can be dire and extend well beyond um, health, but also the, the civic health uh, of our society, that um, we get real serious about investing in people in their own communities and empowering them, um, and that we realize that healthcare is part of a more comprehensive conversation that we need to have. Uh, as you said, I believe deeply in Medicare for All, and I, you know, it started, but I don't think it's going to stop until we get there. Um, it just may, may take a little bit longer than uh, than we all had hoped, but, um, but that work has to continue. And uh, I think there is a responsibility we have uh, to being able to get to an end where um, there is a profound healthcare security in this country, where no matter who you are, where you grew up, who your parents are, what you do for work, that you have healthcare when you need it, that um, we are invested in your well-being even when you're not unhealthy, um, and that we uh, can take the worry and the fear of not having healthcare when you get sick uh, out of your life. And so I think that's the, that's the goal. Um, and I know that our community has to be a part of that. Um, we, uh, we have too much talent, too much capacity, um, too much responsibility, not to. And so um, I, I look at, you know, the generation above us um, uh, who've done some amazing things, but really I look at the generation coming right after us uh, who are really thinking in comprehensive ways about the, the way that they're going to, um, to, to use their talents. And the last thing I'll say is that, you know, again, it's about the why, not the what. And, you know, I, 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 artists and writers and um, journalists and historians and, uh, and um, uh, you know, uh, 
lawyers and business people and uh, all of them are uh, needed in the work of building that more just, more healthy society. And so, you know, if you're somebody who says, I want to be a part of that, remember that they may be your why, but then ask yourself, well, what is the what that's not being done? Like, what is the what that the society needs right now? Um, because sure, you can be a doctor and you can be providing healthcare on the front lines. And that's really great and really important. And I won't take anything away from that. But maybe you're the journalist who's covering health in, in, inequalities in communities and, uh, and, and, and shining a light in an area that, uh, that we need to see. Or you're the politician who's out there um, fighting for more funding and more support uh, for public health. Or you're uh, the artist who is uh, portraying what it looks like, what it feels like for people um, to go in scenarios like this. And so I, I'm really excited about what that generation is thinking about and doing uh, because I think they're thinking a lot more comprehensively about uh, the why problems. Definitely, and I think um, you know you touch upon a lot of that in your in, in, in your own in your own, in the book, the healing politics, right? You, we need to tell our own narrative and our story, right? We don't know how people are going to react. So we have to just put it out there and share who we are as individuals and uh, what our community stories are and, and the multifacetedness of our community and its able and its ability to access health. Uh, so, just want to thank you for your time uh, for joining us um, on the series. Um, we hope to host you at Oma Clinic. In the near future, and love to, to get, give you a tour of our facilities and the work that's okay. being done. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you strength, uh, continue to guide you, and continue to, to use you and, and, and his service, subhanahu wa ta'ala, during these times uh, when we can turn on CNN and see someone uh, with your name, with your background, uh, not only representing the communities that you serve and do, but also wearing uh, you know, the, the honor and the badge of Islam and proudly doing that um, with everything you're doing. So, Jazakallah khair. And we really appreciate it and definitely hope you stay in touch. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Inshallah, we have a special next webinar with Imam Suhaib Webb uh, premiering on May 19th. Uh, please keep Umma Clinic um, first and foremost in your prayers and dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts our work uh, through the, the blessings that he has given us and also through the mandate that you all have given us in your support. Um, you know, we are a federally qualified health center and we have, uh, a, you know, the ability to get reimbursements. But I think as our discussion demonstrated today, uh, we don't turn away anyone from care. We're not uh, a private clinic where we have the luxury of saying we're not going to serve this. And that's because of our, not only our faith mandate, but our humanity mandate to be able to serve anyone who walks through our doors and to enable us to continue to do that. Uh, this is where your support comes in. Uh, so we don't have to tell that single mother with two kids that she can't come in for a child wellness exam, that we can't continue to diagnose cancer in early stages for community members who've been turned away from every hospital, every clinic. Uh, that they can get the care that they need. So, Jazakallah Khair, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Jazakallah Khair, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I hope it was. Um